now it is time for person of interest. And as promised yesterday, today we host a newly elected senator, Homer Bay County, that's Moses Kajuang. Thank you, sir, for joining us this morning. You're welcome. Yeah, we appreciate you taking the time to be with us uh, on Morning Express. Of course, a lot to discuss in as far as politics uh, is concerned and your journey to where you are now. I guess it should be actually congratulations for your win as well. Uh, thank you. It's almost a month since we concluded the elections. The elections. But the congratulations are not too belated. Yeah. They're still coming in? They're still coming in. Okay. Uh, let's first uh, backtrack, talk about your life a little bit. Because um, many people came to know you about Moses Kajuang after, the, of course, the unfortunate demise of your brother. And then, you know, who was going to take over the seat? Your name came up. And here's Moses Kajuang. But who, where did Moses Kajuang grow up? Where were you born? Uh, thank you. Uh, I was born in Homer Bay County, okay. uh, a little village called uh, Waundo. And that was in 1979, 1978. I'm quite not mean? very sure about <laughs> the exact year of my birth because my birth certificate disappeared. And I've never sat my mom down to, you know, pin it down. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are the generation that was called Nyayo. We, we, we were born around the time when President Moi uh, took over power. Mm -hmm. I went to school in Waondo, uh, deep in the village. Right. I later on transferred to Nairobi, went to Rabai Road Primary School, went to Langata Road Primary School, the school whose land we were trying to mm -hmm. grab. Mm -hmm. At that playground, we played on it. I was a head boy in that school, and that was a school playground. Yeah. Then from Langata Road Primary School, I went to Lenana School. From Lenana School, I went to Moi University. And from Moi University, I went to Makerere University. So what did you study at Moi? I studied information sciences. I'm an information scientist uh, by profession. Okay. And at Makerere, I studied information technology. So what does information scientists do? Information scientists manage information okay. in all its forms, digital form, hard form, so you'll find information scientists working in IT, mm -hmm. they'll be working in media, a good number of journalists are information scientists, mm -hmm. you'll find them working in libraries and archives and in records management. Yeah. I chose the information technology specialization within information sciences. All right. And then went on to Makere where you pretty much mastered in the same? Yes. And then work? Uh, I've been in the financial services sector for the last 13 years. Mm -hmm. I've worked for a long time in insurance. And within insurance, I've worked in Kenya, I've worked in Uganda. I've held roles that cut across East Africa. Yeah. I've also had a short stint in supply chain. I worked with DHL, which is a leading supply chain firm globally. Yeah. Uh, I did about a year and a half at DHL and was in charge of the information technology. Mm. So I would say that I'm an information technology specialist with a bias to financial services and supply chain. So you've been a corporate man pretty much all of your working career. Uh, that is your true. Working life pretty That's much. That's true. So politics, this is the first. Uh, for those uh, viewers who are with me at the university, back in, because at Moi University 1998 to mm. 2002, I was elected secretary general of the students organization in second year. Mm -hmm. You know, if you uh, remember the way the public universities are structured, in second year you are still fairly new mm -hmm. and uh, it's usually quite difficult to be elected into any position. Right. But I was elected Secretary General in second year of the Moi University Students Organization. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that I was the chairman of the Students Electoral Commission and we formed a national body of university student leaders. We called it uh, Kenya University Student Leaders Forum, mm -hmm. and I was a founding chair of, of, of that forum. So I've been involved in, I did not call it student politics as such, I called it student leadership at okay. that point in time. So why, because many would transition after that then to, you know, national politics. Why didn't you, why didn't you uh, seek elective position after school? I believe that a good politician is one who is grounded in some profession. Mm -hmm. I don't think that politics should be a full-time occupation. I believe that a good leader is one who infuses some value, brings in some contribution from a different profession. I mean, if all our leaders were career politicians, then we'll not have the diversity that we need to move this country to the next level. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, first of all, attain some level of proficiency and expertise in a professional line, become a professional leader, uh, so that at the right time I could apply that to 
the growth and development of the country. Okay. I, I, and I think that the experience I've obtained as an information technology specialist in financial services and supply chain is extremely relevant to our nation because I would say that we are a digital country. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of digital initiatives going on in this country. And what I've seen lacks is proper discourse, proper dialogue that is underpinned by a good understanding of the issues oh, at the hand. Issues. Okay. Because most of the discussions, if you look at the digital migration, mm. people have taken positions depending on their political parties yeah. or depending on emotion rather than by looking at the rationale of the issues being advanced. So mm -hmm. that technological background, I believe that the 12, 13 years I've spent out there was very good preparation for my oh. role in nation building. Okay, so I remember in an interview by KTN's Victor Ogale, you described and you talked about your family, talking about your father being a polygamous man. Are you polygamous as well? I am not <laughs> polygamous. <laughs> uh -huh. Talk to us about your family, your immediate one. Um, my, my family, that's my wife and yes, children. Yes. I, I'm married to a statistician, a mathematician, Ish. a chartered insurer. Okay. That is one woman. Uh, there are three. <laughs> <laughs> that is all one. Okay. Yeah, my, my wife is, uh, she spends the time in underwriting. She's an insurance professional. Mm -hmm. I've got a son who's two and a half years. Wow. And, uh, you know, he's a guy who uh, takes all the time mm -hmm. that I have when I'm at home, him and my wife. Yeah. I am very committed to my family because at the end of the day, that's all you've got. And, and I appreciate that. And even when I'm campaigning, when I'm out there, I've got a lot of focus on families mm -hmm. because that is something that is dear to the heart of every woman and every man yeah, out the there. the foundation. Yes, so I've got a fairly young family uh, and, and, and I believe in the well-being uh, and welfare of my family. So you don't intend to follow in your father's footsteps? Their time was different. <laughs> okay. I, I think it was a generational issue. Mm -hmm. uh, among the Luo, polygamy uh, was condoned and is still condoned, but the dynamics have changed. You've got HIV and AIDS. You've got a greater economic burden such that polygamy is no longer sustainable. Yeah. And how was it growing up in a polygamous family? Because I imagine then there's these other kids, um, different wives, and sometimes you'll find for some it's competition for attention in those situations, lots of uh, sibling rivalry as well going on. What was your experience like? Uh, I would say my dad was a very good manager, mm -hmm. and he also married women who are uh, equally good managers. We, we had a very unified upbringing. This was a family where we prayed together every morning and wow. prayed together every evening. We went about our cause together. If it meant working on the farms, we'd collectively work on the farm of one mother and move on to the farm of the other mother. Mm. We had all our meals together on the same table. We grew up together. You know, as boys, we slept in the same houses. We called them Simba. Mm. So uh, my parents really made an effort to make us feel like we were one unit. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, my other mother, I just call her big mother. I don't, uh, we, we don't have anything like stepmother yeah. in, in, in my, in my town. Mama Mkubwa. Uh, yeah, so it, she, she's just my mother. It's like my biological mother. Right. So we were lucky to have a, a very harmonious uh, coexistence. Mm -hmm. My parents are still alive, all of them. And every other time we go home, uh, it does not matter which house I go into. Mm -hmm. I am sure and I know that they'll pray for me when I get into that house mm -hmm. and I'll get a meal and I'll be comfortable. Okay. And what do you, do you do for fun? To unwind? Away from the busy schedules, working now, politics is also quite crazy. What do you do to unwind? Some play golf, some go to the gym. What do you do? Well, my experience with golf has not been very successful. I'm stuck at uh, <laughs> entry-level handicap. Uh -huh. uh, but I hope that I'll be able to improve my handicap mm -hmm. uh, when I get some time right. on my hands. But I, I do read a lot. I, I love reading. What are you reading now? Currently, I'm reading Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Okay. Uh, quite an interesting book. Mm -hmm. I just finished One Piece by Leo Tolstoy. I love Leo Tolstoy. He tells, he writes, you know, even though he's writing in the 1800s in Russia, I still find his writings so relevant. Yeah. Uh, and I think Anna Karenina, for anyone who's married, that's a book everyone should it's read. A must read. Yes. Okay. So let's uh, shift gears a little bit. And first, of course, the death of uh, Otinoka Zhuang, shocking to, to everybody. Um, for you, how did you receive the news? Where were you? I was at the hospital mm -hmm. when he died. 
Okay. Um, it was a normal day for me. I was going about my duties. I remember I was at the offices of SAP on that particular day, mm -hmm. talking about some projects to revolutionize the way we do insurance in this, in this country. And um, I got home at about 9 p.m. And uh, 9.30, I received a call from my brother who was in Mombasa that the senator had just been admitted. Mm -hmm. And I thought it could just be a flu or something easy. But, uh, you know, something tugged at my heart. Mm. And uh, uh, when I heard he was at Mata, I, I dashed to Mata. I, I found him when he was in the emergency room and uh, they were trying to resuscitate him. And I was there for about uh, 45 minutes uh, before he was pronounced dead. It mm. was extremely extremely shocking for mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. and to have had that happen a lot of speculation the tests we understand were taken abroad what can you tell us now the viewers of course as a public figure many uh, were keen to find out what had happened is there a conclusion as to what kills uh, Kajuang your brother the samples were taken to Germany mm -hmm. for further investigation uh, the results have not been uh, conveyed back to us uh, I remember the samples were taken alongside those of uh, the late Fidel Castro Odinga, mm -hmm. uh, the son to the Prime Minister, and we are still waiting for the results. Okay. Um, we pray that it will not be found that there was a human hand in the death. Do you believe there was one? Foul play? Um, the circumstances were uh, extremely abrupt, and this is a gentleman who did not have any known issue uh, of, of, you know, that would uh, trigger cardiac arrest. But I would want to leave it to the scientists mm -hmm. to tell us exactly what caused the death. Yeah. So after this and then, of course, the whole situation of who's going to take up that particular position, you in the sa same interview with Victor said that you consulted with your wife first and that she underwent some counseling, you described it, to allow her, uh, to get her to that place where she was okay with you actually vying. Talk to us about that. Why did she need counseling? Was she not for the idea? Uh, yes, it was a, a, funda a very radical shift from uh, what we were used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, were professionals. She's an underwriter somewhere, I'm an IT expert somewhere, and, and life was fairly straight and predictable. Going into politics means that my allegiance shifts from my family to one million people who reside in Homer Bay County. Uh, that, that was significant. And uh, if I was to become a senator, as per the discussion at that at point time. in time, it meant that she would also have to play a public role. Mm -hmm. And she didn't feel she was very ready at that point in time to play the public role. Um, my wife's uh, parents were also in politics in Uganda, and uh, the dad was exiled, and she grew up without the father. Uh, the dad was exiled when uh, Idi Amin took over power. Mm -hmm. and, and so there, there is that feeling, there's that memory that she still has, and a bad taste in the mouth uh, as a result of yeah, politics. Yeah. Uh, but when we discussed and we agreed that we are going to make the sacrifice on behalf of the family and for the sake of the people of Homer Bay, uh, you know, we sat down and said, let's do it, and we left it in the hands of God. Mm. We, we did a lot of praying, uh, we did a lot of soul searching before we finally agreed. Mm. Uh, and uh, the fact that I consulted my wife you know, it just goes to underscore the importance of family in my life. Because, yes, I could go and consult the public gallery, but at the end of the day, it is about me and my wife and my child. Mm. Uh, it is about us sacrificing our life for the benefit of the people. I felt that was important. And in my campaigns, I've also underscored the importance of empowering women and the girl child. For okay. a long time, yeah. we have assumed that women are just objects who uh, should not question mm. or who should not be involved in decision making. That just goes to underscore the fact that in my leadership style, I would like to involve women a lot. As a lot as, and as much as possible. Yes. Before we backtrack and go to, to the whole campaigns and how all of that unfolded, one other question that I know many people were concerned about, especially after the death, uh, and there was a lot of reporting around uh, Otino Kajuang's wife and those, this other lady as well who came out and said she was his wife as well. She, at some point we saw her at the mortuary, um, you know, saying that she'd not been allowed to go in to see the body 
uh, the funeral there were concerns about some kitty that had been set out to ensure his children were still educated and she said she was not being allowed to access the same. Then there was another story, I remember I think it was the Nairobi and where your father had said she should just, if she didn't have money, go back home in Homer Bay and stay with everybody there and stop making all of this noise. What is all of this that was going on and what's the status now with her? Our position as a family is that all children uh, born by the late senator will be taken care of and are being taken care of. Anyone who had a relationship with the late senator, a proper formal relationship, has been embraced and will be taken care of. But why at the time was, that, was there that kind of acrimony that was witnessed with her being denied you know, uh, permission entrance to go see the body? There was quite some bad blood, it appeared. I think because of the emotion, some of the aspects were dramatized. And beside the emotion, the abruptness of, of, of the death uh, probably also meant that we are not prepared to deal with everything. The entire family was going through a very difficult time. We have gone back, we have reconciled, and we have insisted and made it clear that all the children and all those who had a relationship with the late senator will be embraced and will be taken care so of. So is she and her kids, are they being taken care of? Uh, I, um, are they recognized? Because you said all those that are recognized, so are they? Uh, well, if, if you refer to, to faith, yes, the children are recognized. And her? You see, her, the relationship was between her and the late senator. And uh, there are certain wishes that he left behind. And those are the wishes that we'll go by. Okay. Yes. All right. Let's, let's, let's we'll end that there. Uh, let's go back to politics. How was it for you? How are you able to reconcile within yourself? Your brother is dead. Here you are, um, being already propelled into this position to buy for politics. Going through that period, winning it actually, uh, the race, now senator. How do you reconcile all of that? Coming from a sad place to victory, becoming senator. How is all that? How are you able to reconcile that within yourself? First of all, my, my victory, really, I don't have much to celebrate because I lost my brother, who was a senator. Mm. I have not acquired an extra feather in my cap. Uh, already, we had a senator at home. I was doing my job somewhere else. We lost one brother. I had to leave what I was doing to come and fill in for him. So it is not really a celebration for us. It is more of a consolation for us. Uh, and, and so people keep asking me, when are you going to do your victory party? I will do a victory party for the people, mm -hmm. not necessarily for me, because I don't feel uh, victorious when I'm replacing my late brother. Mm. But um, I, I think it's, it's been quite an experience, uh, transitioning from uh, the corporate world into a mourner, into a campaigner, and now into a politician. Mm. It has been extremely short. Remember the late senator died on 18th of November. Uh, we buried him in about a week and a half and almost immediately we hit the campaign trail. Mm. As a family we've not had an opportunity to sit back and mourn and heal. Uh, we'll do it on the fly. We'll do it as you are moving along. As you along. go along. Yes. So this, uh, some have described the campaigns especially as some that, you know, witnessed unprecedented violence. Um, you know, we saw yourself as well with a neck brace. You had been injured. And there are those who point an accusing finger. Of course, it was finger pointing. You accused uh, one of the opponents. The, the opponent said it was being stage managed by yourselves to... Um, and those sympathy votes. What would you say about the violence that was witnessed? My opponent said they didn't beat me enough to warrant a neck brace. And that was the most unfortunate thing. That uh, yes, they say they beat me, but not enough to warrant uh, some of the remedial action that was taken. Mm -hmm. It was quite unfortunate, the violence that was witnessed. But I would also like to say that the violence was overdramatized. I was attacked only twice during one and a half months of campaigns. And, and, and I think by Usually our Usually that doesn't happen, so twice is significant. I, I even once would be significant, being attacked. By our low Kenyan political standards, you would even argue that twice is normal in campaigns. There should be zero instances of violence. That is why we all sign a code of conduct as candidates to ensure that we do not advocate or promote violence. But yes, there were two instances where I was directly attacked and these two instances happened in the same place, a place called Cochia. 
where one of the candidates was coming from. This is all now water under the bridge. We have spoken with each other, we have congratulated each other, and we have agreed to join hands to work together for the benefit of Homer Bay County. Mm. Because politics should not mean that people should kill each other. It is not, I mean, it is not uh, a matter of life and death. At the end of the day, after one and a half months, you all come back, you're all citizens of the county, and you all have a responsibility as leaders to join hands and develop the county. One would argue you're very diplomatic with your answers because on one hand, first ODM as a party had its already um, image begin to be tainted with the botched uh, elections in Kasarani. Then for your particular case, again, we saw the violence and you know disruption that happened, no nominations. And then to the campaign level, you say it's almost normal, but it is not. We have not witnessed recently where other candidates have been injured, even in um, you know, the general elections and the like. So to say that, yes, you've congratulated each other and have moved on is not sufficient for the people, especially in Homer Bay, and for the country at large, to have seen that play out in the political arena, a trait and a trend that is concerning to all. Isn't there more to say? to what happened, especially as ODM as a party and the actions you've taken after that to ensure we don't see these things continue? The, the, the difference between my by-election and the other general elections is that when you have a general election, you've got uh, more than a thousand people competing and uh, the attention of the nation is split across the thousands of people who are competing. When you have a by-election at a county similar to the one I've just gone through, all the focus of the country is in that by-election. And as a result, things can get over-dramatized and things can get hyped up and can get sensationalized. So you're in saying case, there was violence because all the attention of the country was on Homer Bay? I, I, I think the um, few instances where there could have been confrontation were blown out of proportion because uh, there we didn't have a lot of other things that were competing for the attention of the media and the attention of, of the public. But that is not to say that I condone violence. If you recall that campaign, you cannot point a single instance where I, as a candidate, was accused of violence. In but fact, I was yes. the one on the defensive Some all will the time. Some will not be accused of violence, but you know where the finger is pointed? And we've read a few reports on the same. Your brother, TJ Kajuang, Raraka Member of Parliament, it is alleged that at the nominations, it is his bodyguards that fired in the air to disrupt the exercise. Uh, that is because that then is, they wanted is, what then eventually happened, you getting a direct nomination to take place. Th that, that is um, uh, not correct. I was present at the venue and uh, the person who fired in the air did that to protect us from people who were out to attack us. The tent under which we were which sitting... People? Because the men in black had been spotted who had been linked to ODM and who had been there before the nomination exercise. So who are these other people well, that were attacking? Even if they were linked to ODM, that was a gathering of ODM people. It was not a gathering of Moses Kajuang supporters. Mm -hmm. So the action that was taken was to protect us against attack. Remember, there were eight so they members. Did shoot. There were eight members of ODM who were going for the same position. So it cannot be said that that was a Moses Kajuang affair. It could have been any of the eight. But that was also well, very unfortunate. Moses Kajuang's candidature at the time, one would argue? Uh, no, that could not be correct because there were eight other candidates present there mm -hmm. and all these eight candidates had canvassed, they had spoken with delegates and they obviously had their supporters there. So it could not be that Moses Kajuang's supporters would be the ones who would uh, outrun everybody. Now, let me comment on TJ Kajuang's participation in the election. He did so uh, by his own right because one is my brother, and I appointed him my campaign manager. Number two, he also comes from Homer Bay County, and he's got a right, you know, to come back to Homer Bay County and to campaign. He cannot vie for a position because he already has a position in Nairobi. So his participation and involvement in my campaign was perfectly in order, and it was by right. I think any attribution of violence or provocation on his part is completely unfounded. Because all the time I was being stoned, I was with him, and he was not stoning anybody. So back. have you sought to take action against you and perhaps the others who were candidates at that time, against these people you say attacked you? I think it is unnecessary. 
I, it is unnecessary. Why is it unnecessary? Because uh, that do, do we not need to have lessons learned, action taken? So it's a deterrent that you see that, oh, if you try such a thing before, again, uh, uh, if you try it as has been done before, there will be action taken against you. Isn't that lack of any action after such events, what is keeping it happening over and over again? Because, you know, yeah, we got disrupted. Nothing will happen to us. We've seen what happened to Magerer, what happened in uh, Kasarani, now in Homer Bay. It's becoming mainstay with for, for, for the record, politics. For the record, uh, in, uh, on the exact day and same evening when I was attacked, the first time I was, by the way, the first time I was not even attacked. They attacked the rear of my convoy and injured a number of my supporters. And my supporters, they went and filed P3s. Uh, they went, got uh, uh, doctor's assessments, uh, recorded statements with the police, and obtained P3s. And, and those are there. We have lodged cases. No action has been taken by the police. When I was attacked directly, uh, that day I went to Homer Bay District Hospital. I went to Homer Bay uh, Police uh, Headquarters. I recorded a statement. I went to IBC and recorded a statement. Two, three days later, IBC dismissed it for lack of evidence. The case is still with the police, and the police still have an obligation to follow it through. Now, whether I am going to organize a demo in the streets of Homer Bay for these people to be apprehended, that is what I'm saying is unnecessary. Let the, uh, the police, let the security process take its due course without any undue influence from me. And I think as a senator, I would like to promote healing. I would like to promote reconciliation. Some of the youngsters who are paid money to attack us have come back to us and they've apologized and they've said, sorry, we were given money by Mr. So-and-so. Mm -hmm. The key thing is to rehabilitate these people mm -hmm. so that they, be they can become you know, meaningful members of society. That is my focus.